Hi, welcome. I'm Maureen. And I'm Kelly. We'll be telling you about real-time PCR, also known as qPCR. The Q stands for quantitative, by the way. That's right. It's called quantitative PCR because the quantity is measured each cycle. But it's much more accurate to say real-time PCR because the quantity is monitored in time. There are two kinds of RT-PCR. One not so specific with DNA stain called CyberGreen and one we'll explain later with Techman probes. Oh, uh, this is our superhero Techman. We actually didn't mean to call you, so um, you can go now. Okay, back to the story. Real-time PCR is commonly used in the medical diagnostics to quantify the number of pathogenic particles in a patient sample. This can be DNA or RNA. But the method is very versatile. Techman can also be used to quantify the expression level of gene targets. With this method, it's possible to test how many genes are present in a sample. Let's say GFP production from a jellyfish or the percentage GMO in a food product. This technique uses special Techman. No, 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 not you again. But special Techman probes during the PCR reaction. The probe consists of two types of fluorophores, a reporter on the 5' end and a quencher on the 3' end. When the probe is intact, the quencher fluorophore absorbs the fluorescence from the reporter fluorophore. It does so by the use of fluorescence resonance energy transfer, also known as FRET. During the PCR, after the Techman probe has bound to its specific piece of template DNA, the primers are annealed to the DNA. DNA Techman... <sighs> Go... Away. As I was saying, DNA tagment polymerase is, compared to primers, unable to extend the probes. The reason for this is that the probes lack a free hydroxyl group and that the reporter fluorophore is blocking the path. What the DNA polymerase then does is destroy the probe to continue its extension. As a result, the reporter and the quencher are permanently separated, allowing the reporter to emit fluorescence. To support your findings in an assay, you should run the samples in triplicate, but duplicate can be chosen when you're running low on supplies or sample. When running the assay, you should also think about having different controls besides the patient sample. Not only to test the system, but also to test the samples added and the manual labor conducted. For example, when a patient has a disease that is caused by a mutation in a specific part of the genome, the following controls should be taken into consideration. For starters, a positive control with the gene present that contains the same mutation to use as a reference. This can be derived from earlier assays or made artificially. Apart from a positive control, a negative control should also be included. This control doesn't have the mutation and is seen as uncontaminated. If you still observe a signal, then there might be something wrong with your assay. This insecurity can be solved by adding another control where MQR is added instead of DNA. The sample doesn't contain DNA and therefore no signal should be detected. But how are the results interpreted, you ask? Well, it's pretty simple, because the computer does most of the work. On the y-axis you see the intensity of the fluorescence, and on the x-axis you see the number of cycles. RT-PCR needs more cycles than regular PCR because the method is more sensitive so that smaller amounts of DNA can be detected. To separate background noise from results, a threshold is set. This threshold is at the beginning of the linear part of the curve, which is often between 15 and 30 cycles depending on the concentration of your template. Usually samples that need more than 35 cycles to appear above the threshold aren't used for analyzing. The high threshold makes it difficult to distinguish real signal from background noise. We hope you enjoyed our video and that you now are wiser about RT-PCR using Techman probes.